The rice property is an exquisite manner that most are not worthy of experiencing for more than a brief moment of their lives. Like a fine wine, it must be savored in what small quantities it is supplied in, but not one drop more, lest you become intoxicated. And above all, it must never be returned to. If you're as stupid as I am, you'll return anyway. I think it was a month or two after my initial story was posted that I found the second door. I use the word think because time has become confusing to me as of late. All I know for sure is I had resigned myself to the life of a wandering vagabond, migrating towards the dull places of the world, anything that was least likely to resemble a celebration. Sometimes I would take nightly refuge under an overpass, other times in a storm drain. This particular night, it was an old colonial-style home that had been sold by its owner to make way for a new landfill. A sign planted in the overgrown yard courteously told me that demolition was scheduled for noon tomorrow. Tonight, it was desolate and alone on the far side of town. We were a perfect match, and it was more luxurious than my usual fare. I felt it the moment I stepped past the carelessly unlocked door and into the rickety interior. The sensation I got whenever I drifted too close to two or more people having a good time. The feeling of being close to them. This made no sense at first. The building was completely abandoned, but it was in my futile search for a bed that I spotted it, the source of my uneasiness. A door that did not align itself with the colonial sensibilities of the rest of the house, instead donning an otherworldly but strangely familiar pattern. A door that was positioned awkwardly, perpendicular to a broom closet in a place no sane door placer would ever place a door. An undocumented door in a recently purchased home. I must have been consumed with such overwhelming guilt and shame in that moment, staring at the door, that my mind decided I no longer deserved to live in this world. Not after abandoning my family and friends. Surely the quickest death would be to walk straight back into the place I had barely gotten out of alive. My hand feverishly opened the door, and a wind from somewhere far away rushed out at me from the darkness. The closet went on for far too long. I walked for a while. There was no indication of a light at the end of the tunnel, but after some time I was just suddenly there again. The master bedroom. The master was not present. I had been hoping he would see me and offer a quick demise, but clearly that was too much to ask. I exited the bedroom and looked right, considering entering the washroom, wherein lies the mold. I decided against this course of action, as it likely would not have been a quick death. I then went down one floor and entered out onto the next. I was driven towards the door at the very end of the hall. Wherein lies the weeping elderly man and the black ooze. This least advisable course of action would be the most advisable course of action for someone wanting to stop living. It felt like I walked for a year before I reached the end of the corridor. I looked down at my shoes. The black, viscous liquid was seeping over them. I grasped the doorknob and it was icy cold, my skin sticking to it like a tongue to a frozen pole. I turned the knob. There were so many doors to open here. I thought over the sound of the door hinges screaming in agony. Actually, it might have been the elderly man screaming in agony, as the door hinges and everything else in the room was him. Using the flashlight on my phone, I observed that the black liquid coated absolutely everything in this room, as if someone had meticulously painted every exposed surface with tar. If not for my light, 
it would have appeared as a unified black mass, and I would not have been able to distinguish individual shapes. There was not much in the room besides an unlit floor lamp, a grandfather clock, a four-legged bathtub, and the shape of the deathly thin humanoid figure inhabiting it. Every moment I stood on the black-coated floor, he moaned in agony, as if I was crushing his fragile body beneath my feet. I stood there for a while, until it seemed he was not going to attack me. Perhaps because of my light that revealed his form? This was good, because for whatever reason, my urge to stop living had passed, replaced by morbid curiosity. Clearly, if I had been in the property for this long and had not yet been erased from existence, my situation was not as hopeless as I previously thought. I asked the weeping man why he was crying, and he kept repeating the word, pain. I found a spot on the floor that was oddly not covered by him, and stood there, repeating my question after he seemed to calm down. I made sure to keep my light on, fearing that if I turned it off and obscured his form, he would become the entire room and swallow me whole. The weeping man said between sobs that his home had been taken from him. It had been his, but the master had come and filled it with his horrible spires that stretched on forever and twisting corridors to get lost in for a thousand years. He had been trapped in this room by the master and was crying because he could not get out. I asked the weeping man what was preventing him from leaving the room. He told me that if too much of his body left the room, it would become part of the mansion. This explained why the number of windows and doors in the corridor had increased the closer I approached to his room. Clearly, signs of past uh, escape attempts. The weeping man said that the master regularly threatens him with pain in order to keep him busy with his assigned task which is to create new servants to accommodate the constantly growing manor. The servants are the only sentient beings able to be created by the weeping man. Perhaps they are molded after his original form. I don't know what came over me that moment, but I decided to ask the weeping man if it would be possible for me to get a job as a servant. Surprisingly, he was very matter-of-fact in his answer. He told me there's a formal interview process to be conducted into which he instantly divulged without my asking him to. This involved numerous questions about the following subjects. My history of consuming small live animals. My potential allergies to certain types of lace. My opinion on recent imperialistic developments in the void. Anyone who was wanting to seek employment at the rice property should be prepared to answer these questions in a swift and orderly manner as I get the impression that stalling angers the weeping man. I will note that I did not entirely understand the nature of the third subject, but the improvised answer I gave seemed to satisfy him. After completing the interview, I speculated that there were likely others like me employed at the Rice property. After all, no interview would exist if the only servants here were of the weeping man's own creation. Before I got a chance to ask him about this, however, his body went under my feet and carried me out of the room like one of those moving walkways you find at airports. The door slammed shut, and when I tried to open it again, the knob was scalding hot, much too hot to touch. At first I thought I'd been denied the job, until the bit of the weeping man that remained beneath my feet slithered out and transformed into an apron that I distinctly remembered seeing on some of the servants during my first stay at the rice property. I suspiciously picked up the apron and tied it behind my back, noting its impossibly smooth texture. In that moment, a servant approached from down the hall, and I expected to be reprimanded for straying too far from the event. I was surprised when the servant told me to get back to work. It seems a simple apron is enough to disguise someone from the eyes of the property. As of that moment, I am no longer a guest, but a servant. I have learned many things about the property in my employment that I will now detail for the betterment of public understanding. The events never stop. 
The guests who stand around in the grand foyer only cease doing so when the master appears at the top of the stairs and gives a long speech about appreciating their presence. He then initiates a toast, and after everyone has finished drinking their static, they exit the manor in a single file line. I have watched from the windows where they go after that. There's a metal gate at the far end of the gardens that when opened exposes a place where there is nothing. No, not pure white or pure black, just emptiness. It is difficult to explain if you haven't seen it. The guests exit the manor through that gate, and before it closes I have been able to catch a glimpse of a crowd. No, a, a mass of other potential guests in the far distance. It is so indescribably large that it has led me to believe that their species outnumbers ours by an unfathomable margin. I believe I have gazed upon their entire population all at once, and the world they inhabit, which may be partially invisible to my eyes. After the gate closes, there is a period of about one second before it opens again, and a new party of guests enters the rice property, dressed just as lavishly as the last. Upon entering the manor, they are welcomed by the master who promptly disappears into his quarters until the event is about to end once more. The master himself is unlike both the guests and the servants in terms of appearance. He is dressed very similarly to the male guests, but is very large and slightly beast-like. A distinction I only noticed when I got very close to him. I was afraid he would recognize my fraudulence at first, but apparently even he is fooled by my disguise. I am convinced he may have fangs, but this is unconfirmed. On several occasions, I have been tasked with staffing an event, which involves serving hors d'oeuvres that are prepared by the chefs in the kitchen. The kitchen is full of russet appliances that are never used. The food, which continues to have the appearance of television static, is simply derived from thin air by the chefs. There must have been at least two instances in which I have witnessed a guest from our world enter the Grand Foyer and incorrectly execute the sequence of escaping the rice property. The first took a bite of the food, the second simply tried to run out the door before mingling with the other guests. Both incidents resulted in their respective victim being pulled into the floor by an unknown entity. The guests still speak in a dialect too sophisticated for me to understand, but over time it has become slightly more intelligible to me. I've caught snippets of conversation between them, mostly about politics and the stock market. Whenever I have completed a certain task, such as serving food at an event, I am given payment and a new assignment. The payment is completely useless and consists only of wooden nickels that spontaneously combust if I walk more than four meters away from the spot in which I receive them. I've lightly singed my hand three times now because of this. On one occasion, I was assigned to dust the master bedroom, a location usually off limits to even the most senior of servants. Of course I took advantage of this opportunity to rummage through the master's chest of drawers in search of his deepest secrets. Unfortunately, the only drawer that was unlocked contained a sole object, a battered monochromatic photograph of what appeared to be the master, but slightly less beast-like, standing beside a beautiful woman whom I have never seen here. The only place that seems completely off-limits to almost all servants is the basement. I have not been to the basement, but I have heard several servants discussing the dog with diamond eyes who lives there. The most curious part of my time at the rice property is that I never seem to need any sleep or sustenance. Although there is no sky here, the ambient lighting seems to be perpetually that of around 7.30 p.m. in midsummer. My phone never runs out of charge either, and the Wi-Fi here is better than most modern hotels, although the servants who have seen my phone are never sure what to make of it besides the one who attempted to consume it. I am still guessing that there are others like me employed at the property, but with its sheer size, it's no surprise I haven't found them yet. 
I am certain that time works differently here, so I'm not sure exactly how long it's been since I first entered. For now, I intend to stay and learn more about the property and its inhabitants. If nothing else, living under the nose of the enemy is better than a perpetual game of cat and mouse, constantly paranoid of an encounter with them. If you happen to find an undocumented door in a recently purchased home, open it. You might find a fantastic job opportunity waiting on the other side.